to say a few things about how we will conduct this meeting. I want to acknowledge that COVID-19 is causing us to alter our usual procedures. Due to the ongoing pandemic, Council Chair Zelli has determined that it's not reasonable or prudent to conduct in-person meetings at this time. Accordingly, Met Council members will participate in this meeting by phone or other electronic means, and this Transportation Committee meeting will be conducted under Minnesota Statute Section 13D.021. Because we are conducting the meeting electronically, all votes must be taken by roll call. Before we start the meeting, we need to establish whether there is a quorum. With that, Becky, could you call the roll, please? Chambliss. Chambliss. Here. Cummings. Here. Ferguson. Fredson. Here. Gonzalez. Sterner. Here. Zirin. Barber. Here. And with the quorum being present, I call to order the meeting for the Metropolitan Council Transportation Committee for October 11, 2021. Our first order of business is approval of the agenda. Did any council members have any changes or additions to the agenda? All right, seeing and hearing none, we'll say the agenda is approved. Next, we're on to the minutes. It's the approval of the minutes from the September 27, 2021 meeting. Did anyone have changes or additions? If not, I'd entertain a motion to approve the minutes. This is Sterner. I'd make a motion to approve the minutes. It's moved by Sterner. Is there a second? Coming seconds. Seconded by Cummings. Is there any other discussion? Seeing and hearing none. Becky, could you call the roll, please? Chambliss. Aye. Cummings. Aye. Ferguson. Fredson. Aye. Gonzalez, Sterner, aye. Zirin, Barber. Aye. Um, I I think I heard Councilmember Zirin say I just wanted to make sure you heard that as well. Yep. Very good. With that, the minutes are approved. Next, we're on to the TAC report. I believe we have David Fenley here tonight. Good afternoon, everybody. David Fenley. Um, uh, TAC chair, um, it's nice to be here, uh, chair Barber and council members. Um, our meeting on Wednesday, we uh, had two items on our agenda. The first one was an update on the blue line. Um, um, it's nice, obviously, that this is up and running again, um, and we look forward to being able to use it in seven years, I think is what it is. We spent the rest of the meeting um, in a robust discussion uh, talking about uh, uh, ways or, or things that we can do to uh, bring other items onto our agenda. I'll just go through a couple of the things we talked about um, and also plant the seed if if you all have suggestions yeah. about about things for us to to uh, hear about or contribute to um, by all means. Um, one thing we talked about actually, which was because we just got word that the the purple line was renamed was the naming conventions. Um, um, we were, it, we, but we thought it was a little funny that, that not all the colors line up with, with the style of transit, uh, but I'm sure y'all have been through this many more, uh, much more than we have. Um, one thing that we'd like to, to do annually is get a, get a, get a presentation on driver training. Um, we think that, that, uh, we would have a lot to, a lot to contribute there. Um. Um, another thing too uh, would if, if there's a way for our committee to uh, be more involved in other committee vacancies, and that's under the interest of of having our community uh, be aware of the vacancies and 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 uh, potentially apply for other committee vacancies. Um, that is all I have for y'all today. I appreciate it. Short update. Um, it was, it was pretty, pretty, pretty easy meeting on Wednesday. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, Council member Cummings. Thank you, madam chair. It's really just a comment. Mr. Finley. I just, I really appreciate what you bring to this meeting. Um, and I love your updates. I, I like 
the agenda items that you're proposing perhaps to uh, add to your meetings. I think they're, I think the input that you put bring to this committee is really, really valuable. So any way that we can increase that, I think is a, a step in the right direction. So thank you for that. Thank you, council member. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? Um, just a quick comment. So, first of all, I'll um, definitely get in touch with our person who um, circulates the vacancies out to all of us and make sure that that information gets to you. Um, we do have vacancies both on TAC and TAB coming up. So, um, um, those will be, um, uh, I think they will be interviewing late this fall um, for those positions. So, we'll make sure that you have that information. And um, uh, we have, uh, that's my kids stealing food. Um, sorry, uh, we have um, uh, general manager, manager Koyster is on the line. So I'm sure he you heard your comment about um, um, uh, getting some information on our operator trainings and we'll make sure we get something set up with the committee as well. Uh, I see Wes pop on. Did you have any comments on that Wes? No, only, only that I wanted to acknowledge that I, that I heard the comments about the trainings and appreciate them. Thank you. Perfect. All right, any other questions or comments from council members? All right, thank you, David, and thank you for coming again. We appreciate it. Um, next, we're on to our other reports, and we have MTS um, Acting Director Venowitz here first to present. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Just a couple quick updates on ongoing processes. Um, Amy, you're breaking up pretty bad. Just mentioned, um, we are also receiving applications. Oh, I'll turn my video on. Okay. Is that better? Thank you. Yes, much. Okay. Uh, I'll just, I'll be uh, pretty brief. Um, we have a couple ongoing processes. One of the ones you just mentioned is the tab vacancies. And that is, I can't remember the exact districts. It's for four of the districts um, combined. And then also our modal representatives and the first application deadline is next Monday. And I think we are a little light right now on applications. So if you know people that have been thinking about it or um, interested in our work, I would encourage them to apply. We also are currently receiving comments on the regional solicitation and also regional bike network update. And th that also ends next Monday. We are getting comments, um, so there is not a lack of comments there, but if you have people, uh, constituents and advocacy groups that you want to encourage to look at the solicitation and send in comments, we would appreciate. Um, the final reminder is that we have a transportation policy plan amendment that will be making its way through the process. The first step in that is the TAC planning meeting this Thursday. So if you happen to hear anything related to those changes, it is starting at the technical level and it will not be to tab until November and then at the council in early December. Uh, but if you hear any related issues with that, we'd be happy to meet with anyone and walk through the amendment um, so anything is understood before it comes before the council. All right, thank you, Amy. Thank Are you. there any questions from council members? All right, I do encourage everyone to reach out to your networks to um, help us find good candidates for both TAC and TAB. Um, they're both very important parts of the work that we do. So, um, you know, if anyone needs that information, um, just let um, um, Becky or Jenna know and we'll make sure it gets out to all of you. And then we're on to um, Metro Transit General Manager Quistra for his report. Thank you, Madam Chair and Council Members. As usual, I'm going to start off with the COVID update. Uh, since the start of the pandemic, we've now had 531 cases total among Metro Transit employees. This includes 16 cases since our September 27th meeting, and we've had a total of 25 cases in September of 2021. And this is actually higher than our total cases in, Sept in September 2020 before vaccines were available. Our September 2020 total was 18 cases. At this time, we're not experiencing any operational disruptions due to COVID. 
I also want to mention that today's the last, the first day rather, that Metropolitan Council's COVID vaccination and testing requirement is in effect. This means that all Metro Council employees must submit proof of being fully vaccinated or must complete a COVID test each week to perform on-site work. The efforts by Metro Transit management teams extended over the weekend and have paid off. To this point, employees who missed the first deadline have cooperated with their managers to meet the requirement, and we have not experienced any service impacts due to the start of the program. Work will continue through the week to improve the process and seek feedback for the incident command team. Employees currently in the testing program may complete their vaccination series at any time, and Pfizer shots remain available for employees at the Well at Work clinics here at Metro Transit on Monday and uh, Thursday. I want to recognize and thank the Metro Transit staff involved in getting this off the ground. This is a huge undertaking. As you can imagine, uh, with having the number of employees we have, and I also want to thank the Metro Transit employees for doing their part to meet the new requirements. Again, this is this is a this is tremendous amount of work. It required nights, uh, weekends to to get accomplished. We're still working at it, uh, and I just can't can't say enough about the abilities of our staff and our employees to make this work so that we don't lose service as a result. I also uh, uh, wanted to, as a matter of course, provide an operator update at this at this meeting. But uh, today, Brian Funk will cover the topic as part of the information item in the agenda. I just want to mention that the operator shortage remains among the starkest challenges we face as we work towards ensuring we have reliable service that will lead to us rebuilding transit ridership uh, as we emerge from the pandemic. I want to end on a couple of positive notes. Metro Transit is lucky to have many long-serving operators over the years, uh, and we still have around 140 employees with more than 30 years of service. Uh, one of these individuals, transit op train operator Harry Mandic, was recognized last week as the Minnesota Public Transit Association's Operator of the Year. The award was announced at the organization's annual conference and was celebrated at Harry's home base, the Green Line Operations and Maintenance Facility. Harry spent 17 years as a bus operator before moving to light rail, joining the first group of train operators who started before the opening of Blue Line, which at that time I believe is called Hiawatha Line. Last year he was recognized for 35 years of safe driving. I can tell you that I've ridden with, with Harry in the, in the cab. He gave me, gave me my first ride in the cab. And he made it clear from the start that he didn't talk while he was driving. And I really appreciated that. Uh, he's a wonderful guy. We had a lot of opportunity to talk afterwards. And I hope if any of you have a chance to have contact with Harry, that you'll engage him in a conversation because he has so much to offer uh, through his experience and wisdom in, in, in that experience of driving. In typical fashion, Harry received the award uh, by by acknowledging his colleagues, saying that he was a small piece of an organization that relied on the work of so many. Uh, also, coincidentally, uh, the 2020 Minnesota Operator of the Year, Nicollet Operator Melanie Benson, today celebrated her 45th anniversary at Metro Transit. So I wanted to mention that as well. And finally, um, I want to say that Lucy Galbraith has announced her retirement. Lucy's the Director of Transit Oriented Development she was instrumental in starting that office. Uh, I have known Lucy for a long time, and I really have appreciated working with her both in my roles at uh, at the Metropolitan Council and my specific role here at, at Metro Transit. She's a wealth of knowledge. She's had a wealth of experience. Uh, her her she's worked at so many different transit agencies with so many experts in the field, and, and we're going to miss her greatly. She has provided a tremendous service to our organization, and I am happy for her retirement, but sad for our loss uh, of her employment at Metro Transit, but we certainly wish her the best. And with that, uh, Chair Barber, I'll take any questions. Thank you, Wes. Are there any questions or comments from council members? Council Member Chambliss. Um, just thanking everyone for their service. Um, I'd like to get to, to know the bus driver as well. And um, I'm going to miss Lucy. Uh, she, she's a very uh, a bright star in the Metropolitan Council. 
and uh, I got a chance to work with her a few times in her work. So um, if she's not on the call today, um, happy retirement, and I'll try to find her before she takes off. Good. All right. Any other questions or comments? All right. I have a couple. Uh, first of all, congrats to Harry. That's fantastic. Um, I also have had the wonderful privilege of riding up front in a, a train with him. So um, congratulations. Please send him our best verse and tell him thank you for making us all look good. And then um, also to Lucy, um, she has been, we have been so blessed to have somebody who really is one of the nation nationwide experts in transit oriented development um, with us for so long. She's really helped us grow in that area and build that department into something that's uh, very strong and very meaningful. Um, also has had a key role in the development of real pollution and, and some of those activities, which is a good opportunity for a lot of our staff to grow and develop and get some exposure themselves. But um, really she will be very, very very much missed. Um, I will uh, very much miss her, but I am very excited for her retirement and please send on our congratulations to her West. All right, um, with that, then we will move into our business. Um, our first item is an item on consent um, and we have one item on consent tonight. So um, I'd entertain a motion to approve the item on consent. Cummings moves. Oh, Barbara, this is Sterner. Oh, okay, I'll do a second then. Thank you. Moved by Cummings, seconded by Sterner. Is there any other discussion? Seeing and hearing none, Becky, could you call the roll, please? Chambliss. Aye. Cummings. Aye. Ferguson. Fredson. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Sterner. Aye. Siren. Aye. Barber. Aye. With that, the motion carries and the items on consents are passed. Next, we're on to business item number 2021-251. It's purchase agreement with Luminator Technology for bus video technology. And we have Paul Colton here tonight. Welcome, Paul. Thank you, Chair Barber. Good afternoon, council members. Um, I do have the following action item for you this afternoon. And that is that the Metropolitan Council authorized the regional administrator to execute a sole source agreement with Illuminator Technology Group to purchase up to 540 digital video recording camera systems, including spares, in an amount not to exceed $2,950,000. Uh, Illuminator uh, purchased Apollo uh, video camera uh, several years ago. Um, and is still offering um, the same high quality equipment uh, that they did when we went out for an RFP back in 2016. Uh, and we awarded them a two year agreement back then um, and began to replace our outdated and unsupported Verint camera system. Um, and it has become our legacy uh, camera system still used by Metro Transit and MTS today. Um, so MTS has requ uh, requested pricing for up to 540 video systems from Luminator. Uh, the pricing uh, that was provided uh, was $1,500 less per system um, than what was originally ordered um, on the RFP pricing and subsequent orders after that. Um, so a substantial savings to the council um, on this particular uh, uh, purchase. Uh, these new systems will have um, the same capabilities or better than our previous systems due to some technological improvements that are now available. These new systems will replace uh, 346 remaining Barrent systems that are currently on MTS vehicles, including Metro Mobility, some of our contracted fixed route buses. Uh, we would also, as part of this plan, would install 83 transit link buses with this system so that we can also monitor service um, on those vehicles and address any uh, issues that might occur on the bus uh, in TransLink service. Finally, uh, this project is um, funded through regional transit capital. Um, and the, this project was approved by the council in previous capital amendments. So the funding is all in place to purchase these camera systems. And with that, I'd be glad to answer any questions you have. Very good, thank you. Are there any questions or comments from council members? 
All right, seeing and hearing none, I'd entertain a motion to approve business item 2021-251. Chambliss makes a motion to approve that item. Thank you, moved by Chambliss. Is there a second? Back up by Sterner. Seconded by Sterner. Is there any other discussion? All right, seeing and hearing none. Becky, could you call the roll, please? Chambliss. Aye. Cummings. Aye. Ferguson. Fredson. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Sterner. Aye. Zirin. Aye. Barber. Aye. With that, the motion passes. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you. Now we're on to business item number 2021-269. It's a right-of-way acquisition loan to the city of St. Paul for parcel um, I, at I-35 and Casa 50. And we have Tony Fisher here to present. Hey, Barbara um, and, and council members, it's nice to be with you with this uh, item today. Um, here. Business item. Tony, you're a little hard to hear. Is that better? It's still a little quiet. Uh, is that better? Yeah. Okay. Um, sorry about that. I'm happy to be with you today with this business item. It is a, a little bit of background on the right of way acquisition loan fund um, in support of uh, uh, a requested loan for the city of Lakeville. Business item 2021 269. Oh, next slide. Sorry. Um, so the, the Ralph Fund has been around since 1982. It was established by the legislature to um, support uh, right-of-way purchases for um, ways and uh, other principal arterials. It was initially funded through um, a regional property tax levy. And um, it, the real intent is for um, to support projects that aren't programmed. Uh, those are cases where Minda not able to purchase right away for projects um, and um, really look at property that has the potential for appreciating um, what could be cases that might um, develop, be developed for the first time or uh, redeveloped. And uh, for the most part, it really applies to MnDOT's trunk highway system, but um, principal arterials are eligible and they're just a few of those that aren't owned by MnDOT. And then the fund uh, does replenish itself as uh, loans are paid back. That goes back into the fund. So for quite a number of years, there haven't been, had to been, haven't had to be any levies. Next slide, please. So just a bit on uh, where the Ralph program is at today. It does have a fund balance of $15.2 million. Um, we do have 51 outstanding loans on 51 properties at a total face value of $43 million. Um, we're in a historical place right now. A lot of these loans were giving out, given out as the, the system expanded. Um, there are less and less loans given out and more and more paybacks. Um, it is possible we could see up to $30 million um, returned to the fund in the next um, several, several years. Uh, many of these outstanding loans are in Bloomington, uh, 22 in that case, uh, quite a few residential properties along 35W and in the city of Ramsey, um, 16 uh, along US Highway 10 there. And a few others spread out throughout the region. Uh, no new loans have been given since 2017. Next slide, please. So the business item before you is for a loan to the city of Lakeville for a loan of up to $1.1 million. Um, you might be aware that in 2017, we did give a loan to the city of Lakeville for a neighboring property. Uh, that was a, a Burger King site in the southeast corner of I-35 and County Road 50. And uh, this is immediately to the east of that property. So uh, the city has negotiated a purchase price of the property of $970,000, just a little bit less than the uh, estimated market value of the property to reflect that uh, it wasn't the past a gas station and there will be additional costs with construction and cleanup um, due to that. Uh, the loan is uh, is able to and proposed to include up to approximately $50,000 in demolition costs. There's uh, still a, at least a standing building on the site and a, 
approximately $27,000 in administrative costs. And those are things like um, environmental site assessment and um, evaluation of the value of a property. So um, this uh, property will support future interchange improvements. They have been officially mapped in the past. So that is, um, that is the, the target for this property is not programmed in the next five years. And that is why a RELF is appropriate um, to this. However, um, MnDOT has approved the, the loan and supports this, um, though it is an unfunded project. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions from council members? All right, um, seeing and hearing none, I entertain a motion to approve business item 2021-269. Mr. Sterner, I'd make a motion to approve the item. It's moved by Sterner. Is there a second? Fredson, all second. Seconded by Fredson. Is there any other discussion? All right, seeing and hearing none. Becky, could you call the roll, please? Chambliss. Aye. Cummings. Aye. Ferguson. Fredson. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Sterner. Aye. Zirin. Aye. Barber. Aye. With that, the motion carries. Thank you, Tony. Next, we're on to business item number 2021-99 revised. It is the Gold Line Master Utility Agreement with the Office of Minute. And we have Chris Beckwith, I believe, here to present. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. If my audio cuts out, it will turn off of my video. So just let me know. Okay. Um, I am presenting business item 2021-99 revised. It's kind of an unusual business item before you today. Uh, this, the reason we're bringing this back for um, approval for the Transportation Committee and Met Council again is because the agreement type changed, because the contracting relationship changed, um, and we found that out during our negotiations. We also found out there's some additional costs that I can run through with you. So first, uh, let's discuss that the agreement type changed. It is a master utility agreement, an MUA, instead of a subordinate funding agreement, an SFA. And we, um, in working with the Contracting Procurements Unit and the Office of Equal Opportunity at the Met Council, we would determine that it should instead be this MUA, which then results in the relationship not being a subordinate, um, that it's not a subrecipient relationship. Um, so the Federal Transit Administration actually uh, considers a utility owner that they're not they are not treated as a contractor they're retreat um, and or a subrecipient but they're actual property owner of the utility infrastructure. So we are not hiring minutes Minnesota um, IT services we're not hiring them to do the work, but we are reimbursing them for relocation of the costs um, due to of assets under an FTA funded project. So as a public utility, they're exempt from certain FTA procurement requirements, such as disadvantaged business enterprise requirements. However, Minnesota IT, which is a public entity, a state of Minnesota public entity operating under the Department of Administration, would follow their own procurement guidelines, including any DBE requirements under the Department of, of Administration. So that was a determination we made working with the Contracts and Procurement Unit, um, also um, coordinated that with OEO as well. The other thing that changed with, was that the costs increased slightly. Um, Minute is again, a state of Minnesota entity, and we determined there was additional uh, fiber duct bank that we needed to pay for the relocation costs. So we, the cost did increase slightly. So the business item, the proposed action under this revised business item is that the Met Council authorized the regional administrator to negotiate and execute a Metro Gold Line Bus Rapid Transit Gold Line Master Utility Agreement with Office of Minnesota IT Services in an amount not to exceed $2,863,601. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Um, are there any questions from council members? <laughs> All right, um, seeing and hearing none, I'd entertain a motion to approve business item 2021-99 revised. So moved. Moved by Gonzalez. Is there a second? Fredson, I'll second. Seconded by Fredson. Is there any other discussion? All right. Seeing and hearing none. Becky, could you call the roll, please? Chambliss. Aye. Cummings. Aye. Ferguson. 
Fredson. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Sterner. Aye. Zirin. Aye. Barber. Aye. With that, the motion carries. Thank you, Christine. Next, we're on to business item number 2021-252. It's UBSEN sole source for Minnesota Minneapolis bus garage. And I'm not sure who is presenting today. Yes, Madam Chair, this is um, Marilyn Porter, Director of Engineering Facilities. Um, Welcome, Marilyn. Like introduce, yeah, thank you, appreciate that. I'd like to introduce uh, Stephen Smith, and Stephen Smith is the newest um, member of the engineering facilities team, and Stephen will present the business item. Uh, Stephen joined us in July um, as, uh, of this year as a senior project coordinator, and in his role, Stephen will, will be contributing to the team working on the new Minneapolis bus garage, um, as well as implementing and supporting other capital improvement uh, efforts. So with that, Stephen, thank you. Thank you, Marilyn, and good afternoon, Madam Chair and Council Members. Um, this is business item 2021-252. Uh, the proposed action is uh, Met Council authorized a sole source for UPA census a system. Um, uh, next slide, please. So a little bit about the background is that the UBIS system is used throughout the uh, Metro Transit uh, bus garage uh, personnel uh, to find and assign available buses for work and it's similar to an internal GPS system. Uh, this hardware will interface with the hostess uh, scheduling software to highlight buses that are assigned. Metro Transit has been utilizing the UBISEN system since 2010. Uh, a sole source is required due to the existing software and hardware being proprietary. This will be for procurement in the new Minneapolis bus garage system. Um, the main user is uh, the bus di dispatch and maintenance. And um, in 2021, a similar business item um, for some of the existing hardware was authorized to as well. Um, that was business item 2021-121. Next slide, please. I always like to show a little bit of the system. Um, and so on the middle, in the middle left, the sensor there, that's the main sensor that we're purchasing. Um, there's about 160 sensors that will be placed throughout the maintenance and dispatch area of the new to garage. Uh, these sensors triangulate using RFID tags. Um, that's shown um, in the bottom, this is bus tag, um, that are mounted on the buses. The end user map, uh, displayed on the upper left um, will display the location of the bus throughout the garage and then important information about the bus as well. Um, the proposed action for today is that uh, Met Council authorize, award, and execute the sole source contract 21P292 with UBISense for the dollar amount not to exceed 750000 for the software and hardware. Um, with that, is there any questions that I can answer? Arbor, you're on mute. Thank you. Sorry, I was going to say thank you for that and welcome to Council and Metro Transit. Um, thank you. Absolutely. Um, any questions or comments from Council members? All right, seeing and hearing none, I'd entertain a motion to approve business item 2021-252. Council member Zirin moves the staff recommendation. Okay, moved by Zirin, is there a second? Coming seconds. Seconded by Cummings. Is there any other discussion? All right, seeing and hearing none, Becky, could you call the roll please? Chambliss. Aye. Cummings. Aye. Ferguson. Fredson. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Sterner. Aye. Zirin. Aye. Barber. Aye. With that, the motion carries. Very good. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Now we're on to business item 2021-266. It's marketing research services. And we have Eric Lind here and Maria Cohn. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and Council Members. I'm Maria Cohen, Manager of Market Development at Metro Transit. 
and joining me is Eric Lynn, Manager of Analytics and Research. This proposed action is for the Metropolitan Council to authorize the regional administrator to negotiate and execute contract 21P137 with Resource Systems Group for the purpose of conducting market research in an amount not to exceed $1.5 million. Previously, Metro Transit used a full service advertising agency to assist us with marketing research, media buying, and creative development. But we have split this now into two contracts, research and media buying, to allow for more opportunity for proposals. Metro Transit uses a marketing research service to assist us in the development of our annual marketing initiatives. We use research to seek feedback from our customers, potential riders, specific fare tools, brand awareness, priority audiences, and customer satisfaction. These research efforts give us valuable insight and assist us with our long-term strategic planning. With that, I'll turn it over to Eric. Okay. Thanks, Maria. Um, yeah, so we had um, really good response from the request for proposals. There were five firms that put in um, pretty good bids and what really stood out about the vendor that we're going with is their understanding of the strategic nature of the issues that transit is facing right now. In other words, uh, they look like they were going to be a very good partner for us in understanding what our riders and our potential riders want from transit and um, how to find out, you know, what we can do to keep them on board and get them on board. Uh, they had um, really good grasp of the challenges that transit is facing, of course, during this you know uh, unsettled time with the pandemic and they've done similar work uh, and have experience doing similar work in other agencies across the country uh, and then also um, rsg has been uh, a partner in other local efforts uh, and so we knew that they understood the local market and some of the issues that we face here in the um, twin cities region uh, so, uh, as we met, we had strong responses, but, uh, RSG stood out for these reasons. And so we're recommending that that is the, um. Firm that we go with to, uh, support this work. So, this action will advance several thrive outcomes that will help us rebuild transit. Grow ridership and offer more transit options. It will also connect more residents in our region to jobs and housing opportunities and support more transit friendly development. And with that, be happy to have, answer any questions. Thank you very much. Are there any questions or comments from council members? Council member Chambliss. Thank you, Chair Barber. I'm really happy to see that uh, this contract was um, split to allow for more opportunities for contractors. Um, I think that's great. I know several council members have made that recommendation and to see this in fruition this year is, is fantastic. And then secondly, are you able to speak to um, some of the um, ideas or experiences that allows this contractor to have more um, knowledge and ability to help us with the local market? Uh, Chair and council members, I can speak a little to that. Um, so RSG has worked with the council in the TBI program, which is the, the travel behavior inventory program, both in terms of the household inventory, we're doing regional surveys of people's travel behavior on a daily basis. And also as I think a subcontractor on the transit onboard survey, but in general, they've worked on similar both onboard and uh, online surveys of transit customers in um, other systems around the country. And so we feel like they have a really good handle on how to reach customers of all types uh, to get their opinions and experiences. Okay. Okay, any additional questions or comments? Um, I just have one. I'm going to echo um, Councilmember Chambliss's. Um, I appreciate that looking at this a little differently and breaking this into two separate contracts. Um, also, I really do appreciate that um, the group that we're going with ha does have expo experience in our, our market with the TDI and the COVID travel survey. So they will be familiar with uh, what the landscape is as we're going in. And I think right now as we're starting to um, work towards building transit ridership back up, some of that experience will be really, really helpful. 
So um, uh, with that, I would entertain a motion to approve business item 2021-266. Chair Barber, this is council member Zirin. Uh, I move staff recommendation. I don't think we can manage something unless we know what we have. So I um, move the recommendation. Thank you. Moved by council member Zarin. Is there a second? Coming seconds. Seconded by council member Cummings. Is there any other discussion? All right, seeing and hearing none. Becky, could you call the roll, please? Chambliss. Aye. Cummings. Aye. Ferguson. Fredson. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Sterner. Aye. Zirin. Aye. Barber. Aye. And with that, the motion carries. Next, we are on to business item 2021-267. And I'm turning it back over to Maria. And I believe Jessica Cross is also Thank joining. you, Madam Chair and Council Members. Joining me is Jessica Cross. She's Market Development Specialist at Mark Metro Transit. The proposed action is for the Metropolitan Council to authorize the Regional Administrator to negotiate and execute contract 21P138 with Clarity Coverdale Fury for the purpose of media planning and buying in an amount of not to exceed $4 million. Metro Transit utilizes a media buying service to assist in planning and executing large regional campaigns and initiatives. Tactics have included radio, billboards, social media, and online digital platforms. This contract will assist us with developing plans and purchasing mainstream and BIPOC media this contractor will monitor performance, make recommendations for improvements, and provide comprehensive evaluations at the completion of each project. With that, I'll turn it over to Jessica. Uh, thank you. Hello, Chair Barber and Council Members. Uh, we, in evaluating these proposals, uh, we weren't just looking for an agency to buy advertising. We're actually looking for insight and expertise and an understanding of our businesses and challenges for our agency. Um, and so we uh, would like to go with Clarity Coverdale Fury um, because they specialize in the public sector um, and affecting behavior uh, as opposed to selling product. The examples and references they cited illustrated their understanding of the breadth of the community communication needs in our diverse communities. Uh, Clarity Coverdale Fury has also focused on partnering with media providers to build trust and expand understanding of diverse audiences. Maria. So this, this action will advance the thrive outcome of equity and prosperity by providing Metro Transit with critical expertise in communicating with priority audiences. Clarity Coverdale Fury has a depth of experience and community partnerships with BIPOC media and organizations that will help us to expand our media reach and deepen our community connections. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions from council members? Uh, council member Gonzalez. Thank you. Um, I just have a, a question about um, the agency's uh, collaboration with um, other media companies that uh, are centered on reaching out to diverse communities. Um, I just heard from the presentation and from the materials that they do, in fact, collaborate with other folks that have that expertise. Um, my question would be that I do think that the the council has not done a good job in really connecting with those communities in the past and if we have used this company before um uh, perhaps the context that they have within the uh bipoc communities are not working out so I, i'm speculating a lot here because i don't know the specifics of the contract or who they're working with um, but I would just suggest that if, if uh, when you're uh, completing the process with this vendor, uh, that you inquire who they're using in order to reach out BIPOC communities and um, see if there are other voices or other agencies or, or businesses that could be addressed or, or reach out to so they can, um, you know, really connect with the communities. 
so it's it's more of an observation at this time, but hopefully, um, you know, we can do a better job in reaching out to to BIPOC communities. So thank you. Thank you, Councilmember. Are there additional questions or comments, Councilmember Chambliss? Yes, um, I would agree with Councilmember Gonzalez, uh, and would be interested in also getting that information. I know um, several. Uh, BIPOC businesses that have sites that do advertising. Um, and I'm not sure, you know, who this organization works with. I know sometimes when an organization works with other um, companies or uh, businesses, you know, they may list, you know, who they're working with. Um, and so that it's, it, they give more exposure. So if you could uh, bring that feedback to them uh, and see if they would be open to identifying um, some other uh, partners um, that are, are, are part of our MCO uh, universe, that would be great. Or, or outside of the MCO universe if, if they meet our DBE goals. Thanks. Madam Chair and Council Members, if I could respond. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, uh, Charity Covered Del Fury in their proposal they listed out several, probably 10 to 12 um, media organizations that they're actually already working with. And they are currently actually working on something for us, wrapping up their um, contract right now where they're buying some uh, BIPOC media for us. And that was part of the reason why we really were impressed with their presentations because they, they already have some established relationships with media and with some community organizations that can help us do outreach into the, the priority populations that we want to get to. Thank you. Are there any additional questions or comments from council members? All right, then I'd entertain a motion to approve business item 2021-267. A motion to approve uh, that item by Chambliss. Moved by Chambliss, is there a second? Second by Gonzalez. Seconded by Gonzalez. Is there any other discussion? Seeing and hearing none. Becky, could you call the roll, please? Chambliss. Aye. Cummings. Aye. Ferguson. Fredson. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Sterner. Aye. Zirin. Aye. Barber. Aye. And with that, the motion passes. Thank you very much, Jessica and Maria. Thank you. And now uh, we can move on to information, but ahead of that, we can look at um, the items to go consent or non-consent. I would say all of the items that we went through tonight can go on consent to the full council, unless I see any disagreements on that. All right, very good. Oh, uh, <laughs> council member Chambliss. Yeah, I was just thinking that 266 and 267 might be helpful for other council members to um, weigh in on. I think that's a good point. It's it's also uh, shows that uh, demonstrates some of the responsiveness to requests um, that we've been discussing. So I'm happy to have those move non-consent. Perfect. Thanks. Okay. Absolutely. All right. Very good. Then we are on to our information items. The first one is the Twin Cities Highway Mobility Needs Analysis, and we have Steve Peterson here tonight to present. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair and members. Um, also with me uh, today is Paul Zek uh, from MnDOT Metro District, and we do a lot of studies with uh, MnDOT um, in our role as the MPO for the region. So um, you may have, may have uh, seen Paul here in the past uh, several years. Um, but uh, this was a, a multi-year effort here, and you can see the consulting team we worked with was led by SRF, but also included uh, Samba Tech, Texas A&M, and um, Associated Consulting Services. And if you go to the next slide, please. Um, the goal of this study effort was to do something we hadn't done in the region before, and that was to um, look at highway mobility and, and uh, set a performance measure and target for that um, and come up with different outcomes for different investment levels. And uh, sounds sounds fairly simple, but something we hadn't done. In fact, uh, the more we learned about it, it hadn't been done uh, probably anywhere across the country uh, to date yet. So um, the, to cut to the chase, this is the summary slide here first is um, 
the performance recommendation that we have is to use <clears throat> a Twin Cities Highway Mobility target of 40 hours of annual delay per person to calculate MnDOT's 20 year investment needs on the state highway system. <clears throat> So this would be a, a decrease of uh, 5% of the total delay from, from 2040 and 25% um, uh, down from the 2040 base. And of course, uh, we did use a per person um, as the performance uh, measure here because uh, you know we're adding another 500,000 people. So it's uh, to, to can take that into account um, um, by, by sticking with that per person uh, delay measure and the, the cost to do this, um, that 5% reduction on a per person basis is about four to $6 billion of capital investment over the next 20 years. So neighborhoods of, uh, you know, just over 200 or so million per year um, to do that. So next slide, please. And so again, this is what we were tasked with was setting a highway mobility target uh, for use in MnDOT's uh, MnShIP process. And Paul will talk about that a little bit uh, later in the upcoming slides. Uh, next slide. Um, and being the, the planners we are both, uh, we tie this back to both um, our planning documents and to MnDOT's planning documents and looking at specifically at the transportation policy plan and the six goals that we have there, we underline the, the two that uh, we thought were most, most applicable to highway mobility investment. And, and that would be um, access to destinations. And you'll see some of the outcomes here um, where we uh, greatly increase the accessibility to jobs and then competitive economy. And you'll uh, see how we've impacted some of the major freight bottlenecks throughout the region um, as we increased investment in this area. And um, you know, doing this study, as, as the bullet point alludes to, helps us make better decisions, helps you and others make better decisions when we know um, what we're getting for our money. So that was really the, the um, impetus for the project. So next slide, please. Um, we used, when we, when we put in different uh, investment levels, so we modeled, we used, using our regional model, um, different amounts of investments to see what we would get. Um, and this was just capital highway investment. We did um, tie that back to our investment priorities, which, which starts with travel demand management. And we'll talk about uh, some of the telework that we've all experienced during COVID and what that does for our need for um, highway investment in mobility. Traffic management technologies, uh, then if, if, which are more like the signal retiming type projects. And then if, if those don't work, spot mobility projects like new roundabouts or turn lanes. Then moving into the, some of the larger investments like building out our min pass or now called the easy pass system. And then lastly, strategic capacity enhancements. So new interchanges or new lanes. And these investment principles, I um, do believe are, are some of the reason why we had many of the positive outcomes um, that we did have with this study as opposed to kind of building lanes everywhere across the region or new beltways we did follow this rather strict approach um, um, with our investments, and I, I think that yielded some good results. So next slide, please. So part of the investment, and this is again, looking at MnDOT system, um, highway system in the metro area, was that the regional association, uh, which comes through uh, this body and also our transportation advisory board, plays really a, a key part in helping us meet our, some of our mobility goals um, and since we did the redesign back in 2014, we've had um, 10 different cities and all seven counties have been awarded funding for highway mobility projects on MnDOT system, which is quite incredible, um, kind of showing some of the partnerships that are involved with, with making these projects happen. Uh, typically, the regional solicitation pays for about a third of these project costs, um, the local city or county another third, and then, and then MnDOT um, another, the remainder. Uh, remaining third. And so as we measure through the solicitation, there's there's kind of a variety of uh, positive benefits from safety. It's not just the delay that's being reduced, it's the safety and the multimodal elements and other things that come along with these, these uh, highway mobility projects. So next slide. And of course, there's, there's lots of ways you can measure congestion on your system. 
And we went through a long process in coming up with uh, delay per capita. And, and um, it, you know, there's uh, job accessibility. There's, there's a whole numerous ways that that's measured across the country. But this was really the best way and one of the few ways where we could forecast the outcomes out to 2040 and see what we would get for our investment. And that was really one of the key, key reasons why we use delay per capita. And you can see some of the other ones um, shown here. Uh, next slide. Now getting into the results, I will turn it over to my colleague, uh, Paul Zek from MINDA. Thank you, Steve. Chair Barber, committee members, uh, thank you for having us today. I am going to turn off So, Steve, can you hear me? Yeah, I can, yeah. Okay, yeah. I wasn't sure if that was on my end, so or I wanted to make sure that was on Paul's end. Paul, we can't hear you very well. Chair Barber, I am having some trouble hearing you, and I am, and I apologize if others are having trouble hearing you. Yeah, you keep breaking up kind of off and on. Uh, Paul, would you like me to continue here and. Yeah, sure. Okay. No worries, ready. Paul. It, that's we've all had it, this happen. So. <laughs> Get from here and mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah, we'll go through some of these slides uh, rather quickly. It was more more for you to have the slide deck uh, for your information, but this is showing the delay per person. Um, and on the bottom slide in the columns is different investment levels, ranging from our um, kind of no investment to what's shown in the current revenue of the TPP, increased revenue, and then a couple hypothetical scenarios beyond that. So as you can see, as we um, put more investment, capital investment into highway mobility, such as min pass lanes, we do see the delay per person um, decrease. So uh, the modeling did work from that perspective. Next slide. Uh, one of the key findings was job accessibility, and this is um, what the average Twin Cities resident, uh, the number of jobs they can reach in 30 minutes. And, um, you know, we're, we are going to be adding on upwards of, of 200,000, 200 or more thousand new jobs here by 2040. And you can see as we um, increase that investment, the number of jobs that that each person can can reach in that time in a 30 minute time frame greatly increases. So a, ni a nice finding of this uh, study. Next slide, please. Um, this is uh, this one showing vehicle miles traveled, and this is uh, maybe another hot topic that we've been he hearing and other uh, having other conversations about is um, looking at uh, vehicle miles traveled and and potential reduction targets. Um, over the long term um, for the state as a whole. Um, and our modeling wasn't uh, wasn't conclusive, I don't say on, on uh, vehicle miles traveled. What we did see was that population growth was really the biggest driver of VMT, but then as different levels of investment had a lesser impact on that. Uh, we'll be studying this issue more um, moving into the future. Next slide. Here's all the assumptions that went behind uh, the vehicle miles traveled and, and won't go through these uh, in detail, but we did in the modeling effort, we did uh, look out to uh, 2040 and the land uses that have been approved uh, for each community. And that uh, is in the model. What, what it was in the, in the model was if any investment such as a new interchange would uh, deviate from that 2040 land use or population growth and, and make a change as a result of that investment. So that's, that's something that we're gonna be looking forward uh, into the future. Um, and when we did some of the emissions modeling, the other thing that we did note is that, you know, another major driver moving forward um, is the uh, fuel efficiency standards and electric vehicle adoption. I know uh, Tony Fisher who presented earlier on a different topic, but his EB studies 
uh, has been brought to this group. But uh, some of those are are, are um, large have large impacts on the emissions that we're likely to see in the future. Next slide. Uh, from a competitive economy standpoint, in the freight, uh, we did look at MnDOT has a list of uh, the biggest freight bottlenecks in the region. Uh, some of those uh, being ones that uh, have received funding recently, like uh, 494 and 35W, the interchange that where they received quarters of commerce money. Uh, this is showing as we increased investment, we can um, touch nearly all of those freight bottlenecks and make make improvements uh, to those, and that obviously has. Um, benefits to the entire economy and, and to our residents here. Next slide, please. Uh, we did a high level equity analysis and looked at uh, a few aspects of highway mobility. One of them was, does the number of jobs ac accessible change depending on location or, or the um, different uh, income race or, or ethnic groups across the region? We didn't see a, a large deviation in, in the number of jobs uh, when you when you cut the data in, in a couple of different ways there. And then the second uh, avenue that we looked at was if we make investments in highway mobility, what does that do for transit delay across the region? And we did find a, a good result there and that's uh, making this investment um, benefits not just passenger vehicles, but also a lot of the transit routes that are using um, MnDOT's network. Um, of highways throughout the region. Next slide, please. So in the middle of this project, uh, COVID started and, and we obviously saw what, what uh, telecommuting did to our congestion levels across the region and essentially nullified them where there was no congestion across our, our system. Um, now we're seeing um, those rates of freeway volumes about five to 8% below normal and some of our non-freeway routes um, at normal levels or even have more volume across them. Uh, but certainly telecommuting is one of the cheapest, uh, least expensive and most effective ways we can reduce uh, the demand on our system. And so we looked at a number of uh, different telecommuting rates moving forward and, and found uh, not surprisingly that that uh, is, is, uh, has positive impacts on, on less capital need for highway investments if we can get more people telecommuting across across our system. Next slide, please. Uh, one more. So again, now that we have the background, we'll tie it back to uh, that performance target, which is the 5% uh, uh, improvement, uh, which, is, which is essentially trying to keep um, delay across the system essentially stagnant or, or hold it steady as best we can so congestion doesn't uh, go out of control. Next slide. Uh, this goes through some of the results that we uh, just walked through. Uh, this is in the executive summary that is tied uh, or that was tied to the agenda. Slide, please. So again, delay per person, if we may, if we stop uh, investment in highway mobility, delay per person is going to increase by uh, 33%. We've talked about some of the outcomes. If we meet that mobility, highway mobility target, um, I, we, we looked at the capital highway investment approach, um, but of course there's a range of solutions to help us meet that goal from um, travel demand management, uh, transit, bike pet investment, land use changes, there's a, a variety of ways to get there. So it's not uh, just cap, high capital investment that uh, can get us there. And then lastly, uh, telework certainly is another effective strategy in reducing delay across our system. Next slide, please. Uh, one more. So to round out the presentation, we have a number of uh, studies that are going to dig in more to some of the topics. Um, one was Tony Fisher's electric vehicle planning study uh, and its impact on emissions. Uh, Cole Hineker from our staff is uh, leading a travel demand management study that will be uh, kicking off yet this fall. Uh, next year, you will see a regional transportation and climate change measures. And we just touched on the topic a little bit today on the connection between transportation investment and different and greenhouse gas emission rates. Uh, so we're going to dig into it uh, even more so with this next study and, and look forward to those results too. And then lastly, uh, reassessing our transportation policy plan goals. So 
a lot of uh, really uh, poignant uh, studies coming up in the next next year or two um, from our staff's perspective, and uh, we'll keep you apprised of of uh, those as they kick off and get going. So, um, I think we just think we have one more slide, and uh, with that, uh, Madam Chair, I'll turn it back to you and see if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve and Paul, for this really good work. Um, are there questions or comments from council members? How about first thoughts about the four, uh, 40 hours of delay of, of being, or what, how, how do we feel about that? I'll go, go to council member Chambliss because she raised her hand and smiled when I said that. So. Oh, no, go ahead, go ahead and say what you wanted no, to say. No, go ahead. I just wanted to get you guys talking about that because I think they oh. do want some feedback. Okay, I didn't really have a whole lot to say about that. That's why I said go ahead. But, um, yeah, but I would like to, for you to talk about it because I, I didn't quite capture the essence of what, what you were getting at with the, the um, that number. Um, okay, so my question is in terms of the equity analysis um, and your findings that um, the job access didn't really change based on the different funding scenarios, if I'm understanding that correctly. And if I am understanding that correctly, does that indicate that there's more involved um, to support uh, equity populations than just the money? I mean, it could be structural. Um, it could be the way that, um, you know, where, where the way that people live, the way that people work. Um, there could be other factors involved besides just money. Um, so um, maybe a, a little bit further analysis is needed in the next study. Um, and then the second thing is under the telecommuting sensitivity analysis, um, when we get the results, um, I would like to see, for example, increasing telework participation reduces the need for capital investment to meet the performance target. I think it's really important for us to see the disaggregated uh, breakdown, and, and we do have that with the way that we do our um, behavior inventories. So I think it's important before um, you know we make any final decisions to see the disaggregated breakdown to see if there are differences in the impact of telecommuting across uh, you know different variables of the population. Okay, Madam Chair and, and uh, members, some good some good comments there, and um, you know on the equity side, Amy Venowitz will be doing a equity study here. In the short term, I get, uh, this was a high level, I would say, scan, and and many of our um, kind of BIPOC communities have good job accessibility um, by virtue of where the populations are relative to our downtown cores and other job centers, and uh, so more more study needed there and. And uh, the telecommuting, we uh, I think we're at about 13% or so of the of nationwide of people telecommute at least once per month. Um, it was up to 35% at the height of of COVID, so we've been seeing that that number trickle back down. And we're all curious to see where that lands, and um, the impact isn't you know across populations as as you know. And I think uh, it's not. Uh, equal across all population types, who's telecommuting and the impacts of that. So that's another great, great study area that we need to explore. So thank you for those comments. Yeah, if I may. Um, Go ahead, Councilmember Member Chambliss. Yeah, so I just, I just wanna make sure that we are, um, you know, kind of looking at that disaggregated information because if it's, if it's impacting investments and we do have a goal to improve people's lives um, and we find that, you know, um, some of our strategies need to be adjusted in order to improve their lives. Uh, if the data tells us that, oh, you know, this, instead of saying less, we need to do less investment, let's let's look at how we can address the problem, problem um, in another way. If that ends up being the outcome. And I don't, Amy is on here. I know one of the things that one of the equity investments that we made last year was to really do a deeper dive into um, equity impacts and, and, and the, the relationships with transportation funding, um, because it's something I think that probably doesn't get 
looked at as deeply. So I'm I'm really appreciative of this work, and um, I'm not sure we're still in the early stages of some of that. And I don't know, she might have just popped off. Um, and um, oh, there there you are. Hi. Uh, go ahead, Amy. I'll let you take it. Can you hear me clearly? Yep. Oh, okay. So the project we have on the equity investment, it has not kicked off yet. We have been going through a process of writing the scope of work and we had the Alliance helping us over the summer write the scope of work. We were at the equity investment committee, I think a month ago, um, talking to them about the scope and getting feedback on the policy advisory committee that we're going to be using. And we think we're finally ready to go out and the scope of work should be on the street next week. So uh, it's going to be about an 18 month project that looks at all of our decision-making processes in some what I call project type investments. A project type might be how do we invest in transit ways? How do we invest in min pass or easy pass lanes? How do we invest in bike lanes? Um, the actual selection of the processes that we will evaluate will come from our policy advisory committee. Um, so, and this is, it's a pretty exciting project. I'm, I've been really waiting to get this kicked off for the last six months and I hope to come to you after we select a consultant and talk to talk to you about the overall scope of work and also get more feedback on our on the processes that we'll be using in the policy advisory committee too. Great. Thank you, Amy. Perfect. Um, are there any other additional questions or comments from council members? If not, I've got a nice easy one for you, Steve. So um, as you see, as you look at um, these different funding scenarios to get to the 40 hours um, of delay time as the target, um, obviously it requires increased um, investment in um, the metropolitan uh, Twin Cities region. And we know over the past few cycles that the funding difference between um, the metropolitan region and greater Minnesota has shifted where the uh, uh, metropolitan region gets less of a percentage of the mobility funds. So um, it would need to see either new funds or a shift in that in some way, shape or form. Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Getting on a statewide level, being getting kind of less and less of MnDOT's total budget as as uh, pavement and bridge needs are more in Greater Minnesota, and that's where the funding has gone. This is one area that is kind of more unique to the metro area, as far as delay and congestion. Um, it's kind of not not something you see in many places in Minnesota, and so um, higher investment here. Um, would would mean likely more money coming to the metro area, and the good thing about uh, that would be when we do these projects, we also build the the trails and the sidewalks and the ADA investments, and, and the pavements are better and the bridges are better. So it brings with it a lot of other good investment um, for our local communities uh, beyond just the mobility investment side of things. So, great, thank you. And then, our all right, any additional questions or comments? All right, this was really interesting. So, um, yeah, I would love to hear more as you go through next steps, um, but this was really interesting. Did you get the feedback that you needed from us for today? Uh, we we did, yes. This was just an information item, and I know um, uh, Council Member Chandless had asked about the how we arrived at 40 hours. So. Uh, 40 hours of delay was the ant. So when the average person has currently has 42 hours of delay. So if you're going between uh, your house and downtown for work, um, there's a normal amount of time that takes you. And then the extra time due to congestion would be a delay. And so that adds up to, to over a, a full work week, 42 hours per person um, per year. Usually when we do performance measures, we try to show some level of improvement on the existing condition. And so that's what we, that's why, how we came up with 40 hours. 
Um, once you start get, getting beneath that, it gets on, uh, it's not, it's no longer manageable because the dollar values get too high um, for any, and, you know, to, to think that that's a, a likely investment option for us as a, as a region or as a state. So a slight improvement and, and that's why we went with the 40 hours um, compared to 42 hours as the current. I think it's a good way to look as we're going forward when we're looking at increasing population of, you know, at least staying where we are slightly better. And, um, you know, that's, that's a big undertaking in itself. It is. Yeah. Thanks so much. That really helped me. That I should have stared at that. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So one last call. Any other questions or comments? All right. Well, thank you, Stephen Paul. Really appreciate it. Um, next, we're on to our last information item. It's the upcoming service changes and operating hiring update. And we have Adam Harrington and Brian Funk here tonight to present. Welcome. Hi, Council Member Barber. Are you able to hear me okay? Yes, we are. All right. Uh, so, as you mentioned, uh, Adam and I are going to give you a presentation, um, kind of our, our quarterly cycle here to give you a preview of some of the upcoming changes in our operator hiring status. We're gonna flip the order here. I'm gonna start out with our operator uh, hiring update and where we are today, some of the impacts we're experiencing, um, and then we'll close with Adam's update and uh, save some time for questions and comments. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this is uh, obvious to, to everyone on this meeting, but just for kind of the general reminder, uh, when we do not have enough operators and we're not in sync with the level of service we've committed to our customers, uh, we lack the resiliency uh, for unplanned events to uh, have major disruptions to our service and uh, reliability is a core even on our worst days uh, when we are still fielding 97 uh, percent of our service that's not good enough for us 100 percent is where we need to be um, i've been quoted in the newspapers and the media recently uh, describing that uh, challenge that we're trying to achieve uh, and i mean it it's uh, been one of our uh, hallmarks at Metro Transit for years, and that's the goal that we need to try to attain every single day. And we know that our ability to retain talent and then hire new talent is going to be a key for driving both our service res restoration as well as expansion as we hear about all of the great projects coming up. Next slide, please. Looking at our current levels, a uh, key measure again, is our full-time operators plus the part-time weekday. And so today uh, we should have just over 1,200 operators in those two categories. Uh, and in reality, we have 1,130. Uh, we do have some students in training, which is fantastic, but right now we're not achieving our goal, which is what we need to, to meet to be able to not only account for the ongoing levels of people who are moving within the organization, retiring uh, or otherwise uh, leaving service, but also start to make up ground. The chart that you see below shows since December of 2018 uh, where we've trended when comparing these two numbers. And so first in blue is the ideal full-time and part-time service levels. Uh, those requirements you can see um, were much higher than they are today when we were back and running that full pre-pandemic service. Mm -hmm. And then the bottom fell out uh, for the June 2020 pick uh, when we were in the depths of the pandemic. And then we started to recover and rebound and be at our current level for quite some time now. Uh, the service development department has realized a number of efficiencies within the scheduling. And so we're able to run a very high service level with fewer operators required. But the red line illustrates our actual experience. And you can see while we were close to fully staffed in December of 18, we had the lines diverging. Uh, and then we were very overstaffed for much of the pandemic until about March or April of this year. Um, as you may recall from earlier presentations this year, we decided in January to resume our hiring because we knew what the trend lines would do and that we wanted to be able to emerge uh, as strong as possible. Um, but we've started to run into some uh, external forces that I'll describe in a little bit, and it's resulted in um, imperfect service here for our customers. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide shows the uh, 
uh, sort of scattershot approach to um, where we see lost service. Uh, what we're describing in this chart is lost revenue pullouts. Uh, we also have standby buses that we keep track of, but these are the buses that are scheduled for our customers. And so you can see on a month by month basis, uh, we've bounced around. This sort of inconsistency uh, is not what we're gonna be able to provide for our customers because back to earlier in the presentation, that dependability and reliability is the key. And so in 2019, we were experiencing challenges and we were able to, we were able to pull out of them and rebound, but then we'd have a bad month or we had uh, weather impacts and that resiliency was really tested. Uh, then when the pandemic started, uh, we went down and we had virtually no unplanned service impacts until just recently uh, when that number has started to creep up again. Next slide, please. And another way to illustrate some of the same data is by measuring canceled trips. The prior slide was showing uh, work pieces. So one operator may have uh, anywhere from one to 10 or more trips as a part of their work day. And so our strategic initiatives department has been working on measuring uh, trips, which is much more uh, uh, impactful for the customers. That's what people are planning on. That's how they're uh, you know, scheduling their uh, travel with us. And so uh, this chart really is meant to illustrate not the specific details, um, but it's meant to show this year that January through March into May, there was very little activity. We were very highly reliable. We were in a really good spot. And then as those staffing lines started to diverge, we lost that reliability. So when we experienced um, things like higher absenteeism um, or more people who needed to go in training or when we had unscheduled or scheduled rail maintenance activities that diverted resources, we started to see a much bigger impact um, on our customers. Next slide, please. And I know that uh, you all follow the news and um, you're really in tune with this. We're not alone. Um, the overall hiring market has been extremely challenging. It's been hotly debated in the news about what the causes are. Um, there's been a, a phrase called the great resignation as opposed to the great recession lately. Um, and everyone's wondering where have the employees gone? And so uh, from a sandwich making shop in the suburbs to St. Paul Public Schools uh, and their high profile challenges uh, that Metro Transit uh, was able to assist with, to recent challenges outlined uh, by being able to ensure the supply chain has products in stores uh, and truck driver shortages. Uh, seemingly no industry has been immune, but those of us who are looking for uh, professional operators have really felt the pressure uh, this year. Next slide, please. And it's not just local. Uh, within our industry, um, other transit agencies are feeling uh, similar challenges. You can see by a couple of these headlines that uh, whether it's big cities on the East Coast, uh, like Philadelphia, which is SEPTA, uh, the West Coast, Portland, Oregon, uh, or our neighbors to the South in Austin, Texas, um, who have a very bright future like Metro Transit does, uh, we're all struggling right now. Uh, to be able to find qualified applicants and enough applicants uh, to be able to come into these critical positions. In fact, earlier today, um, our marketing director was on a call with APTA, um, the industry uh, trade group, and uh, found out that this has been something that's been holding back and, uh, and really harming transit agencies around the country. And so everybody's uh, gone into their bag of tricks that I'll describe here in just a moment. Um, but people are challenged uh, seemingly no matter what the attempts are. Next slide, please. All right, and so uh, as I do with these presentations, I wanna describe the problem and then describe uh, what we're doing about it. And so we've really tried to focus uh, this year in particular on ensuring that we are retaining our current operators uh, who we know and love and, and appreciate uh, and then also that we're trying to find new operators. And so uh, sort of first in the retention bucket, uh, we've, working, we've been working on and are continuing to expand efforts for employee support. Um, COVID has really uh, strained our frontline workers, as I'm sure uh, the general manager has described at each of the meetings, we really appreciate our workers um, and especially our operators who are out delivering service. Um, but those words are, are not a substitute for the day in, day out stress that they continue to feel 
uh, during the pandemic and even now um, with the waves that we've been riding, uh, even since vaccines became available. We've expanded our apprenticeship program, which uh, provides both newer employees as well as our seasoned employees the opportunity to have a peer networking group. We're really proud of this. We held graduation ceremonies over the last couple of weeks. I got to hear a lot of great stories about people starting out their careers. Uh, and more than anything, it was super rewarding to be able to meet with employees who started it in many cases right before the lockdown of 2020. So uh, we're working on expanding that into a two-year program. So everybody hired now is gonna have an even longer partnership uh, that's recognized by Department of Labor and Industry uh, and has become our nationally recognized program. We continue to invest in training. Uh, of course, when you're um, shorthanded, it's hard to take people away from their primary task and invest in training, but we're doing our best to be able to do that. Uh, whether it's resiliency training, other professional development, safety training, um, and then just you know other mentorship activities. So we know that it's important and we're really trying hard to make that a priority. And finally, uh, as the general manager and chief have described, uh, we're committed to making safety investments. That's uh, one of the large things that we hear both from our current employees and prospective employees uh, is that they wanna feel safe. That's uh, natural, that's something all of us should be able to feel in our job. And so we're looking at um, being able to communicate and then be able to set out for realistic goals that we have control over to be able to provide a safe work environment for all of our employees, especially our operators. Um, on the slide here, you can see we are at now six hiring events and counting. We had one on Saturday that was pretty successful. We had uh, 20 applicants who came through the doors and were interviewed. Uh, right now, I know that at least 15 are continuing on and uh, a number of them have a commercial license or commercial permit. So that's fantastic. And we're really happy to be able to work with uh, new people to bring them on board. And every little bit helps as we continue to try to climb back and be able to reach that ideal hiring level again. Um, on the marketing and outreach front, I just wanted to give another plug uh, for the website that we've continued to look at, refresh, make it easy to understand. And if we could go to the next slide real quick, I'll show you a new creative that the marketing team put up. This is at the 28th Avenue Park and Ride uh, that's served by a couple bus routes, but primarily Blue Line LRT. And uh, this is the former Subway sandwich shop storefront uh, that now is outfitted with this uh, fantastic eye-catching uh, hiring campaign. And so the team's looking for other ideas like this to be able to make use of our own assets uh, as we advertise our positions um, and you know, continue to make use of uh, all the other advertising we have, uh, you know, like the contract that Kelsey brought forward earlier today. Next slide. Um, and we're back to a couple of the other highlights. You know, we are continuing to have a need for full-time operators. Uh, we thought that that was gonna be a fantastic uh, draw when we first started hiring earlier this year. Um, that is very exciting for folks. Um, but it hasn't netted us with the number of applicants that we were expecting. Our wage has increased again to more than $21 an hour as a result of the ATU contract and we continue to provide hiring incentives uh, and we're working on increasing those levels for both the new applicants as well as for employees who refer new candidates because we know that that continues to be uh, the number one way that new applicants say they heard about the position and so we want to be able to continue to invest in um, our current employees who are making those good referrals. We've done a lot with human resources and thanks to Marcy's team for streamlining the process to make this an easy uh, to use application. We've come a long ways um, over the last couple of years in this area. We continue to offer our commercial learners permit assistance program. Uh, that's really not, not something that other uh, folks in our industry have caught on to, thankfully, and uh, we have a great team led by Lene and the Workforce Development Group who continue to make those resources available for people to clear that is typically the final hurdle before they start with us. Uh, and finally, as I mentioned, uh, we are staying engaged with the industry. Uh, folks like Bruce, myself, and, and folks on our team continue our industry peer networking to try to figure out what are some of the ideas that we're able to use um, so that we're able to uh, emerge from this. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Adam for a kind of a recap of where we are today and then what we're looking like uh, moving forward towards December. Great. Thanks, Brian. Next slide, please. 
as Brian mentioned, this is somewhat of a recap of all the information that Brian shared and we've been putting good effort forth as you just heard on hiring and how we can get the word out and maintain uh, interest across the region in this opportunity. But the fact remains we're still about 80 operators short of where we wanna be right now. And as Brian described, we've missed some work for our customers on both bus routes and LRT. They do get notifications from an e-rider alert when that happens. So we try to communicate with our customers as best we can. And our operations team and customer service department really does a great job at managing, managing those situations. But our ridership remains below 2019 levels. And so we have a little bit of wiggle room to adjust. Next slide, please. Here's the more recent graph that you've seen before showing what our ridership levels are at compared to March of 2020. And you'll note that the blue line, which is local bus, we're running at just under 40, minus 40%. So we're, we've been trending up in the last month or so. And no doubt the fare discount has contributed to that as well as some people getting back to their regular work patterns. We continue to talk with our partners, both in the business community, but also with universities and high schools to learn what the travel patterns are planned that they have in the works so we can adjust for them. Uh, but uh, overall, we do have a little bit of capacity that we have to work with. And so when we go to the next slide, uh, we're trying to manage reliability for our customers. We wanna make sure that every route and bus scheduled is one that's operated. And so to manage our service prior to getting our operator levels back to where we want them to be, we're going to adjust our service to better match the level of operators we have. That means on our December 4th pick, we're trying to schedule our service with a reduced operator requirement of about 65. And hopefully that 20 operators that signed up this last weekend will turn into regular operators. We can start to build back some resiliency and begin to turn the ship the other way and start growing our ridership again. But I just wanted to share with you as we evaluate our whole system, there are areas that we're looking at towards where we might be able to trim our service. As I mentioned that our service ridership is still down about minus 40%. So we have some capacity on our service uh, to make adjustments on and there are four principles that we look at in service development. And the first one is equity, evaluating potential service changes and reductions with an eye towards reducing impact in communities of color and low income. We've got a long history in our department of thinking about how our system works and the communities that it serves, and that's no exception in these situations. So we're somewhat practiced in this idea. Uh, so the others are looking at what what routes have alternative service, whether it's through frequency or adjacent route, or if they have an option to drive. And of course, we wanna minimize the impact on ridership and our current customers today. And uh, the underpinning of it all is to preserve frequent transit service on our core network. And that's part of coming back stronger and better as we continue to turn the corner on the pandemic. That will continue to be a cornerstone of our service now and moving on into the future. So as we develop our schedule recommendations, we'll be pulling those together and begin communicating with our customers in the coming weeks as we ramp up towards our schedule adjustment for December 4th. And that is the conclusion of our presentation. Next slide, I think we can stand for questions. Thank you, Brian and Adam. Um, any questions, comments from council members? Council member Cummings. Thank you, Chair. Uh, first, a question. Can you tell me a little bit more about the impact that the partnership with St. Paul Schools has had? And uh, is that intended to last for the entire school year? Or is there, uh, where does that stand? Yeah, um, Adam, I can take the operational impacts first. Um, Council member Cummings uh, through the chair. So uh, things have actually been working pretty well in that uh, regard. We've been able to ensure uh, most days that we have articulated buses on the trips that are uh, passing by the school buildings, um, you know, at the major let out time, we continue to dedicate supervisory resources, especially now that uh, maybe the weather for walking or biking is starting to change a little bit to make sure we have those resources. Of course, 
Uh, the afternoon is, is the peak demand for those rides. That's also when we find ourselves struggling the most for available resources. And so we feel like we're striking the right balance. We have not been overwhelmed at this point. Um, and, uh, and, you know, we're going to continue to work with St. Paul to make sure that we have, you know, buses where they need to be, but not pulling them uh, from other places. And so, Adam, I don't know if you want to address the, the rest of this uh, semester anyways. Sure. So we do have a pass program in place. There are four high schools that have purchased passes for students for the remainder of the semester and that remains in place. And you know that our St. Paul school partners hope to also ramp up their hiring for school bus operators in the same window of time so that they can restore some of that service as well as hopefully uh, more ridership comes back on our service and we wanna avoid overcrowding there. That's member Cummings. Thank you. Just a follow up comment. Um, it, it, you know, these, as we all know, this whole last year and a half has just been incredibly challenging in so many different ways. But I think that um, what you're doing, and I think especially speaking now to the partnership of the St. Paul Schools, um, the creativity, the ability to pivot and work with another entity that has a need really shows our commitment to um, the whole region as a whole and and i think you know it, it came up quickly it came up i think pretty unexpectedly that there was this need and that perhaps metro transit could help to address that need and um and once again staff stepped up and stepped in and uh did what you have done to help and with so many challenges and staff being um, pulled in many directions to address many challenges. I just really applaud the entire staff for what you have done and what you continue to do. I think it just is a reflection of the partnership of the Met Council um, with other entities. And I think that's just critically important. So thank you for what you have done. I realize this is just really challenging times. I appreciate that you're putting out on social media all of the hiring events and so forth. I know I'm pushing them out, pushing them out, pushing it out, and hopefully that will result in um, additional operators coming in because it's a great career, And uh, but there's a lot of competition. So thank you very much for all that you're doing. This is a really interesting presentation. Awesome, Anything, any other comments from council members? I have one question, but I want to echo everything Councilmember Cummings just said. So um, she can have said it better than myself. So, um, but yes, thank you to all of you for all your work. Um, my one question had to do when you're looking at um, um, looking at uh, having alternate service and identifying customers or service where customers have other options. How are you going to do that for people who are not um, typically? Um, uh, like it's not just a, based off of having routes or frequency, but there's autos or other means to get around. I'm just curious. Madam Chair, one of the things that we're looking at are commuter express services, and it might be leaning back on the level of service that we hope to provide in the near term uh, in order to pro provide a little bit more operations capacity, but primarily it's areas where we have extra frequency or extra capacity in buses that can accommodate a lower frequency of service on the same route or a corridor where there might be more than one route operating and there's a reasonable alternative to that service. Hey, right, thank you. All right, anything else from any other council members? All right, just one last time, Brian M. Thank you so much for the presentation and the information and for all the hard work from yourselves and your teams. I know this has been a, a big effort to try and get things realigned to help people stay moving. So we really appreciate all of your hard work. All right, well, um, that is concludes our work for tonight. So unless there are objections from any council members, not seen any, uh, we can be adjourned. Everyone have a great evening. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thanks. Bye now.